Hey, uh, just wanted to go through these slides together and make sure that all of this makes sense. Uh, topic is diagnosing sepsis, and really our focus is uh, understanding how to get to a scene, uh, take a patient complaint, do a quick assessment, and figure out if the patient has any risk for being uh, early sepsis. Um, and so some of the things that go with that. Uh, we'll go through this together. And the first thing is let's define what sepsis really is. And most of us have a pretty good idea that sepsis is an infection, but more specifically, sepsis is a systemic infection that involves uh, organ dysfunction. And we can have a localized infection that can be cellulitis, that could be a pneumonia, you know, isolated to the pulmonary system. You can have infections in many different places in the body. The most common ones we see in pre-hospital are uh, pneumonias and UTIs and possibly scan or wound infections that have uh, made their way through the lymphatic system and survived through, you know, the bacteria that, or whatever is causing the infection survives through the bacterial or survives through the vascular system and then makes its way uh, throughout the body causing other types of problems. And there are some clues that a lot of patients will present uh, when they have this progression of disease that we can pick up on as pre-hospital providers. And we can recognize that this patient has a infectious process occurring and we can do some things to manage those uh, conditions. So um, the next slide shows that uh, it's not just bacteria, but bacteria is probably one of the most common things that we see. But um, when we think of it, sepsis, we need to realize that there are many other things that can cause it. It can be fungal, which is less common, but uh, and also very deadly. Um, but also we can have viruses, uh, parasites, those can be in the GI system, typically, or other places actually uh, in the body, but not as likely. Um, you know, trauma, burns, pancreatitis, all of these things can actually cause some pretty serious problems with our patients. So it's not just bacteria. We can never really safely assume that it's bacteria, although it is the most common thing that we deal with. So one of the most important things here is diagnosis, like catching the fact that somebody has a complaint that is probably in, uh, needs an early recognition for sepsis so that we get them to the hospital and make sure that we clearly define to the people that take over for us that this patient actually has probably a infectious process that's occurring that's made them sick. So as we do our vital signs, we want to do a great set of vital signs. We want good manual blood pressures with accurate response or accurate readings. Uh, we want to measure temperatures. Now, with patients with alter mental status uh, or not an inability to keep their mouth closed to an oral temperature, um, then the next best thing for us to probably do is do an axillary temperature, just making sure that the probe is nice and tucked away up underneath the armpit and that the armpit is closed and that the skin is completely covering and there's no atmospheric air coming in contact with the probe, so we get a decent uh, temperature. Rectal temps, not as common to get in the field, more likely to get that in the hospital. And uh, some of the uh, tympanic ones or the uh, infrared that read over the forehead to the temple, uh, if you have those, those are good. Just be cautious with the, the ones that go through the ear canal to the uh, tympanum or the eardrum is, uh, you know, wax can get in the way. Um, you know, hairy ear canals or uh, just the inability to go up. Whenever we take a temperature in somebody's head, we have to go remember that it goes forward and upright. Um, those canals are not straight into the head. Uh, otherwise, water wouldn't drain out of them quite so easily. So we have to kind of, you know, aim backwards a little bit and upwards to hit that tympanum. If we don't hit the tympanum, we're not probably getting a good uh, temperature. So notice that the temperature is anything greater than 100.4. That, that, that's pretty low grade temperature, but still can be an indicator for sepsis. Now, if you wonder why is a low temperature related to sepsis, then you probably have to realize that uh, patients can go through the process of becoming very septic and they can have fever or chills and go through that process and never call us until it's gotten past that to where now we have ultramental status. Now the body has the loss of ability for the hypothalamus to control our temperature. And then we get to what we call cold sepsis. And that's just as associated with hypotension and is more associated with a higher mortality. So a patient that's been sick for a long time, that's part of our history anyway. Um, septic patients rarely show up 
that I just suddenly got ill. No, generally there's a, a progression of disease that we need to pick up on. So getting an idea of when was the person last normal and then what was the first problem that they noticed. Those are very important history questions for us to get. So looking at their vital signs, uh, we know that the inherently normal vital signs uh, for any patient that's sitting there resting in a chair waiting you know, for us to assess them. If we see blood pressures anywhere from 60 to 100, we often consider those very normal. However, uh, more specifically, as a you know, pre-hospital professional, if you'll look at that heart rate as I want to see 60 to 80 in somebody that's resting and has a resting heart rate, and I want to, if I see anything for anywhere from 80 to 100, uh, I know above 100, it's very easy to say, okay, there's something going on that may cause some problems or is, is a result of some problems, but anywhere from about 80 to 100, uh, I want to want to figure out why are they uh, have a heart rate that's above a good resting heart rate. So um, anything over 90 is going to fit our criteria for, you know, doing this stratification to see is this patient possibly a septic patient. You know, not just a, a, you know, not just a common cold, upper respiratory infection going to true sepsis. Um, respiratory rates above 20, shouldn't see that very often, uh, minus the hyperventilating patient. Every time you see somebody with a respiratory rate that's much higher than you expect, then you've got to add that into this whole uh, mix of things that we're looking for to screen for sepsis. Uh, O2 sets less than 90. Um, First thing and foremost, make sure we're getting a good waveform on our uh, pulse oxes. Pulse oxes are notoriously erroneous, so make sure that it looks, you know, like it's giving in this accurate reading. Uh, look at the patient's mucous membranes. Look in the uh, down in the conjunctiva. Look in the uh, mucous membranes in the mouth and see do we have, you know, patients pale or cyanotic. Now, MAP pressure. If you don't have an automatic blood pressure cuff, uh, then you probably don't get a good map pressure. However, there are apps out there for free for iPhones where you just can uh, open the app and put in the systolic and the diastolic and it gives you a map pressure. Uh, nobody wants to do that kind of math or that calculation, figuring the difference between the systolic and diastolic. So I won't even go into that. But uh, if we see low blood pressures, you know, we want to know, you know, is that map over 65 because that 65 uh, is you know, good, fairly good perfusion at 65. And anything that's less than that, we're considering low perfusion status so that we're, we're probably going to start seeing shock type signs, skin modeling, uh, cool, pale, and diaphoretic skin. And then last but not least, altered mental status. Um, this is easy on patients that are fairly normal that, that got an infectious process, but it's not so easy on patients that have generally an altered mental status to begin with. So this is where we rely on family members to tell us, you know, is this patient's mental status different? Uh, and if it's different, how is it different than their normal mental status? So determining that they've had a decline in mental status, doing actually a good GCS, you know, ask them good short and long-term questions. And they know currently what's going on. Like, what was the last holiday? Um, you know, where do you live? Um, what, what was the last family member you visited? Something that's pertinent and short term versus something that's long term and check their mental status. Be very thorough with it and see, you know, is there anything abnormal for this patient? So if you look at these, all these criteria together and you can hit all of these and you see a patient that's got any sort of a source of infection or a possible source of infection, new altered mental status, heart rate greater than 90, respiratory rate greater than 20, SATs that are less than 90, temperature that is even mildly elevated with uh, MAP pressures that are low, you don't even have to have all of these to lead you towards sepsis. But if you have all of these, you definitely got to consider that's possibly the diagnosis. So I have to mention this, that, you know, septic shock, you know, shock in general, I think all of our pre-hospital providers are really pretty good at picking up on septic shock. This is high heart rates, well over 100. This is hypotension, blood pressure is well under 100 or 90 systolic, you know, with diastolic numbers quite low in the 40s and 50s. Um, this is not a hard one to figure out. These patients are definitely altered mental. Um, we're definitely going to be managing the airway, providing oxygenation, assisted ventilations. Um, if we have the ability to get an IV and start fluids, we're definitely going to do that. Uh, your paramedic level folks are going to be hitting, uh, you know, leave a fed very early. Um, so while we're filling up the tank that we can get some good perfusion going to the brain so that the mental status will uh, improve. And uh, most folks that have experienced this, the, the you know, experience of giving fluids, you know, oxygenating your patient, 
assisting ventilations and then getting that vascular pressure up with some IV fluids, maybe using a little bit of levofed. We've seen those patients increase their mental status in the field just from increasing their perfusion and, and volume status. So very, very important stuff and uh, it's not hard to figure out. So, um, so where do their fluids go? Um, you know, some people may have nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, but that doesn't always have to be the case. They can um, you know, evaporate due to having a fever that has been unmanaged for a while. But in general, what happens is you have the same volume of water for the most part, you know, as, per, as long as they haven't been, you know, in, in not taking anything by mouth for a while. But what happens is bacteria, whether they're producing just their waste products, which we consider exotoxins, or if the bacteria have been lysed by the immune system or other antibiotic medications, um, the endotoxins, the inside portions of the bacteria, they can all produce this chemical called nitric oxide, which is essentially the same as nitroglycerin that we give when we give chest pain uh, patients medication to the nitro. So this basically vasodilates everything. So it's the same volume of fluid, hydrostatically speaking, it's the same volume of fluid, just in a bigger container so the pressure gets low. Uh, and so that's why we try to fill up the tank somewhat. You know, we're only talking a liter or two and usually a max of three liters of fluid. Um, we want to be cautious with patients that have poor cardiac output. So then if they do, we tend to go to leave a fit earlier, increase their uh, perfusion status and their MAP pressure until we can get enough fluids on board that we can start taking the levofed away. So it's really just a matter of, you know, do we have the same fluid in a, in a nice, happy, uh, vascular, small system? You can see that dog is pretty happy because everything is like it's supposed to be. And then you take that same volume uh, of water and put it in an Olympic swimming pool and you're not going to have much. And that's how our septic patients kind of are. So your gestalt is not enough. Many, uh, Clinicians will uh, go with their gut feeling like, does this feel like sepsis? Uh, maybe it doesn't. Um, the trick to this as pre-hospital providers, as I was talking about, septic shock is really easy to recognize. No, it's only your very uh, intuitive and, and keen and, uh, you know, assessing pre-hospital providers are going to catch these symptoms of uh, possibly sepsis. So uh, I reiterate once again, you know, check their temp, see if it's over 100.4. See if their heart rate is greater than 90, along with their respiratory rate being increased and new ultramental status. And if you've got something that tells you their MAP pressure or you can get the app, you can figure out what their MAP pressure is. You're basically looking for these three categories of things that lead us towards a patient's at risk for sepsis. Even if they haven't gotten to the point where they're just tachycardic and hypotensive with ultramental status. So um, just using our gut and our intuition is not usually enough. We actually, you actually have to use some good assessment tools and then think about um, stratifying those things, you know, on some sort of standardized format. Now, for the paramedic level folks, we see uh, cardiac stress uh, when patients, especially the more elderly uh, patients are tachycardic from being hypotensive, they get high heart rates. High heart rates don't go very long, very fast without causing some sort of uh, stress on the myocardium. So hearts get stressed when they're tachycardic for a long time. You take a, a patient that, uh, you know, elderly patient that doesn't do a lot of physical exercise and in a regular portion of his life doesn't have a high heart rate. So he does pretty well as, at providing good perfusion everywhere. And then you take him and make him tachycardic but during an illness. Then you end up with a patient that has a heart rate that is not something that was well tolerated. So you expect to see some ischemic changes. Um, You'll see ST segment elevations. You may actually have patients that have chest pain. But in those kind of patients, this is a result of being sick. This is not a primary cardiac issue. They are not tachycardic because something's wrong with their heart. They are tachycardic from being hypovolemic, hypoperfusing, and possibly just in the septic realm. And it's going to cause some stress because the heart's going so fast. So in those cases, truly our goal is to reduce you know, their temperature, increase their volume status, get their MAP pressure and blood pressure back up so that their heart rate will slow down. And many times, if it hasn't sustained for very long, those cardiac stress patterns that we see in the EKG will start to fade away as we get some of the stress off the myocardium. Um, next. All right. So we get to talking about uh, hypotension and some management things. Now, this transient hypotension, I must say that for years, um, taking care of sick pe people, um, I've seen blood pressures uh, trending on automatic blood pressure machines that go up and then down. You see a low one, you see a low one, you see a high one. 
and you, you start to think, well, it's my auto cuff, you know, I'm not going to rely on it completely. And it's probably erroneous sometimes. Maybe that was road noise. Maybe it was positioning. Maybe the patient had his arm flexed or not so much, maybe at uh, different blood pressures. But what we discover if we really pay attention to these blood pressures, when a patient starts yo-yoing their blood pressure, where you get one reading on the same arm that's high and the next one five minutes later is low. If you start to see that, clue in because that patient's doing that because they're losing their ability, their you know, physiologic autonomic nervous system that's losing the ability to manage their perfusion status. And these patients are sick. If you start seeing yo-yo blood pressures, you're just going to start realizing that your patients are sicker than you thought they were or that they look like, and we need to be managing them more aggressively. So uh, increasing oxygenation, either, either by just non breather, assisting with a BVM, Maybe if they've got fluid on their lungs, using a, a PEEP, something to manage their oxygenation level. We need to get their fluids back up and catch up because the yo-yoing blood pressures are dangerous if we ever see them. Now, the reason I wrote innovating is dangerous because, first of all, if you have to get to the point where you can't volume resuscitate, you can't fluid resuscitate your patient, you can't oxygenate them non-invasively, they're so sick that their mortality is high anyway. So getting to the point where you have to innovate it, septic patient means that their mortality is highly at risk. So if we do have to intubate our septic patients, this is a case where we want to keep our intubation uh, or our ventilatory pressures low. I don't want to squeeze the bag really fully. I want to ventilate until I see the chest rise. I don't want a in huge increase in antithoracic pressures. Don't, don't fill up the lungs completely. Um, make sure that you're using high concentration of O2 in the short term and getting them oxygenated, but let's not squeeze the bag all the way because we squeeze the bag completely, start really filling up the lungs full of air, then that puts pressure on the vena cava, blood return back to the heart will be minimized and we actually can cause persistent hypotension because of our ventilation. So in an urgent situation, some really important principles are to ventilate you know once every five to six seconds and not any more rapid than that okay the diffusion of high concentration of oxygen especially with a little bit of peep and i'm talking about three centimeters of water this is good for oxygenation but we want to let these people uh have more time to return blood to the heart without the high uh, thoracic pressure so don't breathe too fast i know you know a lot of us tend we get excited we want to, we know they're hypoxic when we feel like, you know, ventilating them effectively and rapidly is getting them oxygenated back up quickly, but you've got to fight that urge and you've got to give them respiratory rates at, you know, between five and six seconds. Don't get in a rush. Good, good quality ventilations at those rates actually reoxygenate patients very well. So the last thing there on this page is uh, communicating with the receiving facility is letting them know what you have early because uh, many of the hospitals being the sepsis, sepsis is such a hot topic these days. Um, they want to know as soon as possible that they've got a sick patient coming in so they can have the resources ready to get get uh, on them, assess them. They, you know, the new criteria nationally is, is, is they've got an hour, you know, from time of recognition, you know, to the time the patient presents to start, you know, administering IV antibiotics. Uh, and to do that, you've got to uh, recognize that the patient's septic in the first place. So um, good recognition, stratifying the modified serious criteria, the Q-SOFA. I don't think anybody can really agree what a good criteria is, but these same principles seem to be common throughout these uh, different criteria that we use. Uh, so increased heart rates above 90, increased respiratory rates above 20, poor SATs, altered mental status, poor MAP pressures, and a temperature all got to let us know that we got to let our receiving facility know that we've got a possible septic patient coming in. And these patients get better care. If we get on them early, aggressively resuscitate them fluid-wise, leave a fed if necessary, manage the airway, early antibiotics, these patients' mortality rates go down. So it's not a surprise that getting on them quickly can be very helpful. And pre-hospital folks can have a huge impact on this if we're paying attention. So bottom line, uh, as long as we've got plenty of fluid, fluid resuscitate patients before we ever try to intubate them. That is a big thing. Get two IVs on all of your sick patients, not just your septic patients, but start some fluids on them. Um, fill up that tank, keeping in mind if they got a history of CHF and poor cardiac output for whatever reason, cardiomyopathy, history of previous major MIs, 
Um, be cautious with giving the rapid fluids, but otherwise I'm pressure bagging these fluids in. I'm getting them in quick. I'm seeing patients that increase their mental status uh, fairly significantly in most cases if we catch them early enough. Fluid resuscitate them, oxygenate them with a number breather, assist them with a BVM if I need to. Just try our best. If we, if we get to the point where we have to intubate them, you've got to consider the fact that if, if I use ketamine, especially if I use Versed or any uh, opioids like fentanyl, morphine, um, all of those will kind of blunt the autonomic nervous system. You know, ketamine, not as much, but um, if I get, start giving drugs where I can intubate somebody, uh, I'm stealing that, that adrenaline surge that they have that actually may be maintaining the crappy pressure that they, that they have, and now I've got a worse pressure that, that is resulting after I've given drugs just so that I can facilitate an intubation. Honestly, I'd, I'd rather fluid resuscitate them and make sure that I had to intubate them before I do intubate them because I know that the mortality is dropping if I get to that point that I've tried to fluid resuscitate them and they're still not better. So fluid resuscitation, levofed alongside oxygenation therapy, those are my goals. That's what I'm going to do and I'm going to make the patient make me intubate them at the last resort only if I can't get away from it because their oxygenation status is not going to be adequate or their drive to breathe is not good enough. So those are really important uh, concepts for us to do. If we do intubate them, use lower ventilatory pressures. That means lower tidal volumes. That means be using PEEP as necessary, but not going farther than, than we have to to get good oxygenation. And anytime I'm getting greater than 90% on my SAT, I'm getting to that realm where I'm a little bit more comfortable and I know the patient's not going to be a hypoxic. I can gently try to drive that up. If I can hit 94 or 95, I'm going to be happy there. I won't use any more tidal volume or any more um, PEEP than I'm, than I'm using to attain that. So that's where I'm going to kind of stop. All right, so some take-homes. We're going to reiterate this. Um, here's your criteria. Ultramental status, any level of ultramental status, just somebody that is lethargic is a mental status change, uh, minus any alcohol, opioids, benzos, anything else that would cause that. Increased temperature of 100.4 uh, or greater. Um, heart rates that are up above 90. Respiratory rates that are up above 20. SATs that are below 90. And MAPs that are below 65. These are my criteria. So here's my, here's my treatment priorities. Always oxygenate. Don't hesitate to oxygenate your patients whenever their SATs are low. Okay, fill up the tank with fluids. Do that as aggressively as you think you need to. Pressure bags are great for this. Um, just reassess as that's going in. Rechecking blood pressures every five minutes, making sure what kind of progress we're making. And once we start making decent progress, maybe see our map get up over 65, you can probably reduce the pressure on the pressure bag and start just keeping through using fluids. If that fluid's not getting my pressure up, my map pressure up, then I move to pressors and I don't wait, especially on my acutely altered mental status patients. I'm going to go to Levofed, start at low dose and then incrementally like two mics a minute, four mics a minute, six mics a minute, whatever the lowest dose I can get by with to get my patient's pressure up and get my map pressure up so that I can get some good evidence of perfusion. Cap, check the cap refill, you know, see if I'm getting, getting somewhere and avoiding intubation. I always say make your patients give you the treatments that become more aggressive. So I'm going to make my patients make me do what I do. That means that I'm going to stave off innovation as long as I can. I'm not looking to innovate these folks because I'm going to, I'm going to you know, have to possibly give them medications to innovate them. If I'm kind of teetering back and forth with a mental status, like oh, I've got to give medications to innovate this person, I'm going to keep aggressively trying to resuscitate them before I get to the point where I have to innovate them. Now, your, your grossly uh, unconscious patient with a very poor pressure and a high heart rate, those are no-brainers. You're going to have to tube those folks, but just realize that we're doing this, and at the same time, we're giving uh, fluids and pressors. This patient is critically ill. The mortality rate is very high for those kind of patients. So, and then let the ER know quickly. Let them know that you're coming. Let them know what you have. Give them uh, a really good indicator that you've got a patient with altered mental status, a fever, high heart rate, high respiratory rate, and a hypoxia and they'll get the idea as well as you that we've got to be aggressive and they'll get on these patients hopefully as soon as we get to the ER.